Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. The Bible says in Luke 24, verses 1, the Amplified Bible, it says, On the first day of the week at early dawn, the women went to the tomb taking spices which they had made ready, and they found the stone rolled back from the tomb. Now this is an account of the morning where Christ had been raised from the dead. He was no longer in the grave. And women came in, you know, with spices, okay? And the Bible says, and they found the stone rolled back from the tomb. But when they went inside, they did not find the body of the Lord. And while they were perplexed and wondering what to do about this, behold, two men in a dazzling raiment suddenly stood before them, which are angels. Okay? And as the women were frightened and were bowing their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among those who are dead? Why do you look for the living among those who are dead? Why, I repeat that, do you look for the living among those who are dead? And the Bible says, He is not here but has risen, the Bible says. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be given over into the hands of sinful men whose way or nature is to act in opposition to God and be crucified on the third day and rise from the dead. And they remembered, the Bible says, his words. And the Bible says, and having returned from the tomb, they reported all these things taken together to the eleven apostles and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with whom who reported these things to the apostles. And the Bible says, but these reports, listen, seemed to men as idle tale, madness, vain things, nonsense, and they did not believe the women. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb and stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen clothes alone by themselves and he went away wandering about and marveling at what had happened. Now, this is where I want to uh, focus on. Of course, in Jewish culture, okay, it was believed that when somebody dies, they have to, you know, embalm their body, okay? And they had not had an opportunity to do that earlier. So women get the spices that are used in anointing dead bodies, and they go to the tomb, okay? And they want to see how they can get to that body and see whether they can do what is supposed to be done by Jewish ritual. Now, the story is given that they get to the tomb with spices and they find that the stone is rolled away. When they find that the stone is rolled away, they are perplexed, they enter the tomb and they find that the Lord Jesus Christ is not in the tomb. He's not in the grave. He's not there. So they're wondering, what has happened to this man? Who has taken this man? And so, interestingly, two men appear to them in dazzling raiment, which were angels. They're asking them the question that I want to, you know, draw the foundation of our teaching tonight. They ask the question, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? the dead. That's why I want us to draw our own understanding of this. And now even more than that, these men tell them, don't you remember what he spoke to you in Galilee? That he shall be given over to men for death and that he shall rise again. Now he is risen. So the Bible tells us they ran to the, the apostles and the people that had believed on Christ and tells them, hey, the guy is not there. He's risen. And the Bible says the people that received these news, including the apostles, well, they called it utter nonsense. It was like a tale or a fable. It was like a false story. Even them which walked with Jesus did not believe that the man had been raised from the dead. And then eventually Peter runs to the tomb 
the grave. He looks through. He doesn't see the man. And the scripture tells us, Peter marvels. He's confused at what happened. That means he also has not believed the resurrection. The world at large has a problem when we start talking about Christ risen. If Christianity was simply a faith of a man who died, it would perhaps be easier for certain people to understand in their level of understanding. But there is nothing that disturbs the world like believing that the man we are talking about was raised from the dead. Those of you who study religions like Islam, they don't doubt that Jesus existed as a prophet. Okay, they believe that Isa, or they call him Isa or Jesus, existed as a prophet. They do believe it. They believe and count him as one of the prophets of Islam. Okay? But their issue, even in the Quran, is at the point of death. They don't believe that actually he was killed. They don't believe that he was raised from the dead because in the first place the Quran doesn't teach that he even was killed. Another took his place, so the story is given. But all of this is human nature trying to avoid the reality of the greatest event that took place in the history of mankind. The resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Have you ever imagined if Christ was not raised from the dead, what the world would look like? Have you ever thought for a moment if Christ never came out from the grave? Many people don't think about it, but I do. And I'm thinking, he would not have had an opportunity to go to hell, to defeat the devil once and for all and capture the keys of death. We would not be where we are. The purchase of our eternal salvation would not be complete without the resurrection. It wasn't only in the death. The story of the Christ is not even half if the resurrection does not take place. Everything that we all allude to, to the Christian faith, is the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Okay? Now, to the world I would understand if they do not allude to this story, if they do not, you know, connect bits to this story. But let's get to the faith. We go back to scripture and we have an event of men which walked with him, which, you know, lived with him, which saw signs, miracles, and wonders before their very own eyes. The lame walked when they were seeing. The deaf heard when they were seeing. The blind saw when they were seeing. Things happened and these men were watching. They walked with the Christ. He taught when they were listening. He gathered thousands of people once and they did not have a meal. And he fed them by a miracle, by two fish and five loaves of bread. And these people were watching. Jesus himself had raised Lazarus from the dead and they were watching. All of this took place before their very own eyes. And just three days into this death, they come to the tomb. And the angels tell them he's risen like he had spoken in Galilee. They don't even remember that particular word that was spoken on that day. I don't know whether at that particular point their eyes were fixed on the miracles of the hour. I don't know whether at that particular point or period when Jesus was speaking those words in Galilee, their eyes were on their personal need. I don't know whether uh, the time he spoke those words the way they received them, probably they did not understand what he was saying, but with whichever means you could take this. Many a time in scripture, the Son of God started to give signs that he had come for a period, he had come uh, with a particular uh, destiny defined on his life, he had come with a definitive assignment, and he was to die and be raised for mankind. And so, three days, after that, the angels have to remind these women that actually, when he spoke in Galilee, you were there. He told you that he was going to be given over to the hands of evil men which opposed God. And that he was going to be raised from the dead. His reason, he said it. Don't you remember that? Oh, they remember. And when they remember, they run. And they get in two men. And the Bible tells us that partly of the people they meet when they go back, were apostles of the eleven. And the Bible says they took them as tells. 
They did not believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. The Bible says, and they called it madness. They called it same things. They called it nonsense. The men Jesus had walked with. The men that had eaten with this man. The men that had seen all his power and miracles and wonders. They could not believe. Even if they knew that he raised the dead and he was the resurrection and the life. He spoke those things in their presence. But on that fateful day, three days after, when women tell them that the man is not in the tomb, at least if the Bible says that they believed in part, no, they called it madness. They called it nonsense. They called it a same thing. This is a man who had proved himself over and over before their eyes. But they doubted him. They doubted the resurrection. So, don't blame the world if they doubt the resurrection. Some of the men that walked with him doubted the resurrection. At first. They doubted at first. In fact, later when you read scripture, many of them believe after seeing him. They don't believe because he had spoken. No, but they believe after seeing him. Oh, so many people say, oh, there's a Thomas that doubted. Okay, but what about these guys who hear that the man is raised from the women on that account and they, they call it madness. They call it foolishness. They call it nonsense. It's a harder thing to believe in the resurrection of this particular man, Jesus Christ. Why? Because Satan knows the power of that testimony. He knows the power of that testimony. If Jesus had found a disciple while he was still alive and told the disciple, I have raised a person in Gennesaret or in Jerusalem, they would believe because they had seen how much power this man demonstrated in his life. But how come it was hard for them as individuals to believe in the resurrection of the man who gave the dead life? Scriptures tell us of the events that took place on the day when he was on the cross. How the weather changed and it darkened in that hour. How the dead were seen on the streets, raised also. But before they could see the Christ, many men doubted that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And because of that, they were looking for the living Christ among dead men. Now that figure of speech, okay, is not new in Jewish culture. It wasn't the first time it was spoken by these angelics. Even before this was spoken in Jewish culture, if you study, that statement exists, looking for the living among the dead. But in the Jewish culture, it means you have no business to go to the dead, to the graves, because those are unclean places. It's places that have no life. And so we see seekers. You know, ardent seekers and lovers of God seeking for him among the dead. They don't seek the seeking. These women are coming to seek. But they're seeking for a living God among the dead. He's saying, if you had understood the scriptures that I'll be raised on the third day, you'd not have come to the grave. You'd not have carried your spices to come to do a Jewish ritual over my body if you knew what I had said. But in that very figure of speech again, we can liken it to many events, and I want to share some of those, where we see people looking for a living Christ among dead things. For a living Christ among dead things. Okay? Now, when we go to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 22, I want to read us something there, okay? Now, the Bible says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. The Bible says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles uh -huh, and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. The Bible says, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Whom, and I love 24, where I want to emphasize from, God has 
raised, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden by it. When it comes to death, the Bible says it was not possible for Jesus to be held by death. Did the disciples of Jesus Christ know that it was not possible for him to be held by death? Did the men of the hour that saw these things and heard the words that Jesus spoke have it in their understanding that it was not possible for him to stay dead? So, some people think, okay, to the mind of men, in our understanding, our human understanding, the resurrection of Christ is a miracle. And it's truly a miracle. Okay? But to the understanding of God, the miracle is in what he does in the resurrection, not the resurrection. When it comes to the mind of God, the resurrection of Christ was not a miracle. Why? Not because God can raise the dead, but because it was not possible for death to hold Jesus Christ. It was not possible. It was not possible. Think about it. It was not possible for Christ to be held in death. It was not possible. <laughs> Glory to God. I wish somebody understands what I'm saying. It was not possible to hold him in death. It was not possible. It was not possible. Now, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, how can you seek him among the dead? In other words, how can you assume that the Christ can be in the dead things? How can your mind even think for a moment that Christ... You see, the Bible says, and I'm not saying that if it was there, I would have done better than the 11. I'm not saying that. I'm only saying that we should do better because the 11 taught us something. The Bible says these things are written for, for your learning. That through patience and comfort of scriptures you might have hope. Okay? Now we are in the dispensation that has seen better, knows better, understands better. The 11 went through stuff that we have seen and have told us. These women went on the grave. And for our own sake, now we carry the understanding by the scribes that keep these manuscripts. For us to read, to know that we cannot look for the living among the dead. What I'm trying to say, it was not possible for death to hold Jesus. Why was it not possible for death to hold Jesus? Because his life. He said, I am the way. He said, I am the truth. And he said, I am the life. I am the life. The Bible says, in him who, Jesus, was life. And the life was the light. And the light, the Bible says, shines in darkness. And darkness comprehended him not. Darkness could not hold him. Darkness could not restrain him. Darkness couldn't. It could not. There was no way darkness could. There is no way in no matter that darkness could do anything on the person of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is light. He is light. In that light, darkness could not hold. Death is darkness. Death is darkness. I tell people. That darkness has no power. Darkness is a result of the absence of light. Also, it doesn't matter how much darkness is around you, whether you're talking about the darkness of death, the darkness of sickness, the darkness of poverty, the darkness of luck, the darkness of challenges happening in your household, the darkness of your child and drugs, the darkness of the issues with your spouse, the darkness of whatever would be happening in your life. Listen, the presence of darkness is the absence of light. In its own, darkness has no power to resist light. It's not possible to get into darkness and light a light and darkness holds light. It's not possible. And God likens death, likens destruction, likens sickness, disease, likens poverty, anything that is evil and negative. He says it's darkness. It's just darkness. It's simply the absence of light. It was not possible to hold a Christ. It was not possible to apprehend him in death. Yes, for the human understanding, the miracle is the resurrection. 
But for the divine understanding, the miracle is in what he does in the resurrection, not just the resurrection. Because this was no normal man being raised from the dead. Many men had been raised from the dead before. The prophets, the Elijah's raised dead people before. Men in history were raised from the dead before. This was not the first coming back to life. Since the return of Christ, since in memorial, probably last year, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 100 years ago, people have been raised from the dead. Either by prayer or any other way, men have come back to life. But this was no ordinary resurrection. With this one, there's that added, you know, epiphany on it. There was no way in which he would be holding in death. It was not possible for him to be holding in death. It wasn't possible. He raised him up because he had to be raised. Why? He could not be held in death. It was not possible for him to be held in death. The Bible says in the book of Revelation 1.18, the Bible says, I am he, this is Jesus speaking, that liveth, now he's revealing himself to John. He says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And the Bible says, and he says, and I have the keys of hell and death. I have them. Hell and death don't have him. He has them. He has them. But now let's go back to the conversation of how men look for the living among the dead. How men look for the living among the dead. I've heard people, even men of God, believers, preach a Christ that quite does not fit in the events and affairs of the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ as revealed in Scripture. Many times people give opinions, ideas, and words touching this person of Jesus Christ that quite does not connect to the mind of God and how he is supposed to be seen. But like the women in the tomb, like the disciples, they had forgotten what Jesus had said. The Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word. Every word. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. He didn't say man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word. No. The Bible says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Every word. Do you know why he says every word? Because it's not just the few scriptures we pick to give context to what we carry as ideas of the person of Jesus. No. It's getting these things and putting them in perspective to what everything says from the beginning to the end. The full picture of the Word of God. The complete knowledge, the big gnosis, the advanced and complete knowledge which is in Christ. The knowledge in God that gives you the full account from the beginning to the end. And epignosis is not something that a man arrives at because of too much reading of the word. I'm not saying that I'm against the word, but there are people who have read the Bible from cover to cover hundreds of times, but many things are still hidden from them or are not registered in their spirit, even though their eyes read them. Epignosis is an experience of the Spirit. It is an experience of God by which the Father himself impresses the revelation of the person of Christ on the human spirit by experience. And that is why I believe in the experiences of God. Because there are things God will never teach us simply because we open the scriptures to read them. Not every man who reads the scriptures interprets them the way they're supposed to be interpreted. Men have gone to theology school and come back from theology school when they don't even believe the basic tenets of the faith. I've seen men who have gone to Bible schools in whatever Bible schools they go to and they come back without believing in divine healing. But they went to Bible school. I've seen men who have gone to Bible school and come back with liberal understandings of this faith with a confused understanding of the word of God but they were taught by the best but even them that teach cannot demonstrate the life they teach 
Okay? It's like you sitting in a class and they're teaching you about divine healing and they can't demonstrate it. <laughs> How can you teach a man to drive when you cannot drive? How can you teach a man to sing when you cannot sing? It's not possible. It's just not possible. Okay? So it's not just about, oh, we read the word. There are many people, like I tell you, who sleep in the word, wake up reading the word. But the way they read it, they don't read it in the experience of the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. What do I mean by this experience? I mean that point where the person of the Spirit teaches you. The person of the Spirit instructs you in the teaching. Many people read the Bible alone, but they assume that they are with the Holy Spirit because they think that by that assumption, their mind, you know, assenting to that experience, they think that then their faith is attuned to the ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach them. No man is supposed to read the word alone. That's why he sent you the Holy Spirit, the helper. The primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is not to heal the sick. The primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is not even to convict the sinner. The primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is to teach. He says that when the Spirit is come, he shall teach you all things. He shall teach you all things. It is that teaching that convicts the sinner regardless of how the teaching takes place some people think teaching is one dimensional that you sit before a teacher and then they open scriptures for you to understand no teaching is multifaceted god can teach a man through a visitation god can teach a man through one vision of experience and that man wakes up and they're born again without anybody speaking or teaching them the gospel the way men understand teaching but that doesn't mean that they have not been taught by what they've seen that's why the disciples of Jesus Christ find a man casting out devils in his name and say, ah, we found one casting out devils in your name and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. He doesn't go with us. We've not seen him in our meetings. Why did you get the Bible? Ah, Jesus tells him, look, if a man is not against us, he is for us. Leave the man. But they did not ask Jesus, how did this one learn how to cast out devils? Because Jesus taught that man another way. There are many ways Jesus teaches people. And some people have a problem with that. Why? Because they think God has to teach people the way they were taught. Oh, because the man went to Bible school and that's how he learned and he gets a qualification and probably gets a caller. He thinks, oh, everybody has to go to Bible school to learn Jesus Christ. And so they have a problem. Oh, you know, the only way you can get rid of this is to take people to Bible school. You have to make sure that every person has gone to Bible school. Listen, I know people who have gone to Bible school and have brought destruction in the body of Christ and still continue to destroy, even with PhDs, with master's degrees in theological fields. So I'm not against Bible school or theology. I believe in it, and I, I recommend it. But I again stand to say it's not the only way men would learn of Christ. Uh -uh. And note that if a man didn't go to theology school or Bible school, that means they don't know Jesus. That's deception. Who invented it? Who teaches you what you are being taught or what you're teaching men? A man also, in his own ideas and understanding, it's okay to throw a systematic line of theology to help certain people get all this in order. But not all people ascribe to that teaching. And not all people are taught that way. And it doesn't mean that because a man went there, that means he's the best. No. I have seen men who have master's degrees in theology, but they can't raise a fly. And I've seen men who don't even know how to speak, articulate. And they're laying hands on the dead and they're coming to life again. Because the rest is not to the swift, but to the strong. No. Time and chance happens to them all. But the word there for time is experiences. That's what I'm trying to say. That every believer needs an experiential hour beyond the spectacular. The things that your eyes have seen to prove the authenticity of the person of God. The children of Israel saw God at work 100% when they were coming from the wilderness into the promised land. Waters were separated. They were parted before their very own eyes. But even when the waters were parted before their very own eyes, and they crossed the other way. When Moses left them for just a couple of days and went up on that mountain, they assumed maybe he's dead, maybe he's not going to come back. In just a few days, they had already built up a molten image of a calf to worship. 
but they had seen the spectacular. They had seen the spectacular. In my life, I have walked with men who saw God working before their very own eyes. He saw miracles. He saw the power of God moving in meetings. They saw the demonstration of the Holy Spirit in those meetings. But I saw men who fell off even when they saw. No amount of miracle can sustain a man in God like the miracle of epignosis, of the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ through the experience of that man's spirit. There are men who can tune in now and see the lamb walking on our meetings. They can see blind eyes seeing for the first time in our crusades and deaf ears hearing for the first time, limbs growing in our crusades. Those videos exist. But a man can see all of that and still doubt. No amount of miracle can sustain a man to believe in God and worship in the way they ought except for the miracle of the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. That is what he promises and says on this rock. When he comes, he asks his disciples, who do you think I am? Or who do men say I am? Oh, they say you're Isaiah, you're one of those prophets, okay? Who do you think I am? And Peter says, ye are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, flesh and blood reveal this not unto you, but my father, which is in heaven. He says, and on this rock, I will build, which rock? The rock of the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ by the Father. That's the epignosis. He says, I will build my church. And he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And it's to that church that carries that revelation that he gives the keys. And he tells them, whatsoever you shall bind on the earth, it shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loosen on the earth, it shall be loosened in the heavens. That's the church that receives keys. And what do keys do? They open doors. They open opportunity. The power of doors is the opportunity for manifestation, the opportunity for the demonstration of the power of God. We demonstrated power over the years, undoubted things that men cannot doubt. But even seeing all of those things, some walked off. Some doubted the same God we preached. Some doubted us as ministers of God. Some doubted whether we hear God. Because it's not just enough for a man to see miracle signs and wonders. Listen, even if the greatest miracle happened on the earth, there are men who can wake up tomorrow and doubt God, even with the greatest miracle. And I believe even at the return of Jesus, in the hearts of fallen men, there are some who will even first not believe even when their eyes are seen. They'll be marveled, but some will be thinking, what's this? Because they don't have the understanding. It's in them embedded nature to doubt. Okay? So the more carnal the man is, listen, we used to think back in the day when we were younger, oh, when people see this, they'll believe. No. It's the revelation. It's the revelation that can only sustain and not all people as a man of God, a minister you believe to, carry that revelation. And because they don't carry that revelation in God, how can they understand you? How can they believe you as a man of God? How can they connect to you and understand you if they don't understand God that way? And, and for some, until that revelation comes, some it comes, some it never, depending on the place of their heart, because the word that we were given, this Bible that we read, is simply there to help put men on the course, to align them to the convictions necessary to relay their heart for this revelation to come into their spirits. That is why the Bible says in John, for there is no greater joy than I have than my children coming to the knowledge of truth. There is no joy in the heart of the Father like when somebody comes to the knowledge of the truth, not assumed knowledge of truth. Why do you think Jesus was crucified? By men which had 
the whole Old Testament to them. They had the testimony of the prophets. The Bible says, which of the prophets did you not persecute in the book of Acts? When he was telling them as the Pharisees, he says, one to you. For you say, you, you, you go and watch the sepulchers of the prophets. Eh? You watch them and say, oh, how could our fathers have done that? But Jesus said, but you, if you were there, you'd do the same because they're of that nature. And these are the same men that shout to Pontius Pilate and say, crucify him, crucify him. Crucify him. They are saying crucify him. Yet they carry the oracles in their own hands. They have built orders and systems of the same oracles in their own hands. But with those oracles, Christ is not revealed. Yet from Moses, he's expounded of himself. From the beginning of the world, he's expounded of himself. If you go through the Old Testament, you see Christ all over. But they still doubted. Why? because of the absence of the light of the knowledge of the glorious gospel, the person of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Even the high priest, when he says, Know ye not that a man should die for the sins of many? This is the high priest, okay? But the scriptures don't tell us that he believed in Christ, even though he carried the prophetic utterance by reason of the office of the priest. Not all who sit in the office to minister in the office of what God has ordained on their lives necessarily carry the full understanding of the person that they represent in the realm of epignosis. This is so deep and far for many people, even though I'm using the simplest language, and I know you understand by language. But the Spirit to articulate the reality of this experience and to know the pain that heaven carries when men do not know. The Bible says, who wills that all men be saved and that they might come to the knowledge of the truth. That's why Paul prays for the church, that they might have a spirit of wisdom and revelation or understanding in the knowledge of Christ that their eyes will be flooded with light that they might know. That's the prayer of this man, to make all men see what is the mystery of this fellowship because there are many people who are living a life of blindness and as the far blind they are, they are looking for a living God in the dead because all ignorance is death. All ignorance is death. All ignorance is death. In the beginning, the Bible says, the earth was without void. It was without void. The Bible says it was full of darkness. Gross darkness hovered over the earth. But when you read the word there, darkness, the word there, darkness is translated as ignorance. And because of the presence of ignorance on the earth, in the world, okay, the Bible says the world was empty. It was void. There was no life. There was nothing. Everything was destroyed. That's the typical picture of ignorance. Hosea says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. The Bible says, their honorable men shall be famished. Their honorable men shall be famished. Because they carry no knowledge within them. Gross destruction takes place when men lack knowledge. Death, physical, takes place when men lack knowledge. Spiritual death takes place when men lack knowledge. Because I have seen people who can hear a man teach and teach Jesus and open things to them in the world that they have never seen or could never see and don't even carry the ability to see. And they wake up tomorrow and point on that same man and tell him, we don't believe in you, you are a cult, you're a devil worshiper, you're this, you're that, you're this. And you're like, would the devil reveal this Christ to you? I thought the ministry of the devil is to steal, kill and destroy, not to reveal. But you see, what is Paul's? To swine. What is this to those whose eyes don't see, whose spirits and ears don't see, who don't know the priceless glory of revelation and what it can do in the life of a believer? And because of that, they walk on in darkness, the Bible says, for they carry no knowledge, no understanding. And the foundations of this world are out of course. Why? 
because they walk on in darkness. The Bible says, for they have no knowledge or understanding. And the courses of this world are out of course. The foundations of the world are out of course. The world starts to go out of order because there is darkness and there is ignorance. And he tells them, but ye are gods. I have said, ye are gods. But you die like mere men. What do I mean by looking for a living God among the dead? When a man is void of the revelation of the full person of Jesus Christ in the word spoken. When a man cannot connect to every word written in scripture. We live by every word. We don't live by a few words which we join together or borrow when we are sick, when we are poor, when we are lacking. No. We live by every word. So if the Bible says you live by every word, it means you're supposed to invest your life, your time in every word to understand everything in scripture. But how many of those who are even opposed to this pattern even read their own Bible? Many of the people who are lost in that are people who don't even take time to open their own Bibles. The people you see in that discussion, in cheap talk about men of God, about ministers, about false thieves, I don't believe in that. These are people who can't even open the Bible because they don't read it. They don't read the Word. And because of that, many of them are seeking for a living Christ in the dead. In the dead. And because of that, even some in professing to believe in Jesus, their lives are full of death. Their businesses are dying. Their marriages are dying. Their ministries are dying. Everything around them is dying. And some have even come to the acceptation, like some men teach, of these deaths and failures and disqualifications and darknesses around us for acceptation. Some are accepting it. And then getting scripture and misconstruing it to minister to that darkness so people accept that darkness, so people accept sickness, so people accept death, so people accept destruction, so people accept failure. I've seen Christians confessing, you know, I'm diabetic. How can you say that? How can you say that? He says he was wounded for his transgression. He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of your peace was upon him. By his stripes, ye were healed. In Peter 2.24, he says, by his stripes, ye were healed. He said, the inhabitants of Zion, none of them shall say, I am sick. Oh, but what if the doctors found diabetes in my body? Yes, doctors found diabetes in your body. But he said, but you shall not say that I am sick. For he says, look before you, I've placed life and death before you. For life and death are in the power of the tongue. How can a believer say, I have diabetes? That's looking for a living God among the dead. How can a believer say, I am poor? Oh, because you don't have money at that moment? Or oh, because you lost your job? Or oh, because the business died? Even if the business died, let it die all at once. You cannot confess failure. The communication of your faith, Philemon 1.6, becomes effectual as you acknowledge every good thing which is in you, which is in Christ. Not the acknowledgement of what is bad. That is looking for a living God among the dead. That is looking for a living God among the dead. And he has not told you to look for the living God among the dead. Yes, there's disease in the world. Viruses are in the world. COVID is in the world. Yes. But you cannot say as a believer that I can die. I might die from COVID. You cannot say that as a believer. Let the world say that. No, let the world say we are crazy because we are not saying that. It's okay. But as a believer, God has given you the confession of your mouth. It's supposed to be the acknowledging of every good thing, which is the new in Christ. He says, if any man should speak, let him speak as the oracle of God. Let him speak as the oracle, as it befits the oracle of God. That's how we should speak. But every time you speak failure, every time you confess sickness, you confess poverty, you confess lack, you confess this, you confess that, you are seeking for the living God among the dead. You're professing of the living God among the dead. You are saying, I believe in Jesus, but this is dead. How can you even observe lying vanities? Do you know what they That observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. So what if you're feeling pain in your body? Refuse to acknowledge that pain and say, I believe in the healing power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I am healed from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. I claim divine health regardless of what I feel. I don't care whether they say you have stage four or stage 
stage five or whatever stage could exist. I don't care what the doctors say. I don't care what biology says. I don't care what science says. I care what the word of God says. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. I refuse to see the things I must not see. I refuse to confess the things I must not confess. Why? Because I remember every word that has been written of him. I don't dispel the realities of truth as nonsense. When we say God heals COVID, people say, ah, that's nonsense. The world can say that. Oh, when I say God heals HIV, oh, that's foolishness. Let the world say that. Let them say that. But we have documented testimonies of people healed from HIV. Doctors have checked them for months and years and they're healed totally. Yet these are people, there's even some I know which were born with HIV. Even in Gulu, we had the case of a child who was born with HIV. And it's been weeks and weeks since then they cannot trace the virus in the boy's body. So let the world doubt. But the believer cannot doubt. Because with God, all things are possible. That's the living God among the living. In other words, Jesus dwells among the living. He's not in the grave. He's not in the death places. He's in the life places. He's in the light places. He's in the glorious places. He's in the triumphant places. He's in the victorious zone. That's where the believer lives. And I'll show you why. Now here's the good news. The Bible says in John 12, 24, the Amplified Version, he says, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth, and dies, which grain of wheat is that? Oh, Christ, 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 okay? It remains just one grain. He was alone until his death. It never becomes more, but lives by its own self. But if it dies, if it dies, glory to God. The Bible says, if it dies, it produces many others and yields a rich harvest. It produces many others like it. <laughs> now you know why we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection of the person of Jesus Christ. Because when he dies, he abides alone. When he is raised, the Bible says he yields more harvest of his nature. Now, what was settled in Jesus Christ is now settled in every believer. That means you cannot die. Your staff cannot die. Oh, but I suppose I've seen death. Now you know the truth. And because now you know the truth, the truth shall make you free. For whoso the sun sets free, is free indeed. The Bible says the devil came but to steal, kill, and destroy. But it says, but I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly until it overflows. I'm come that you might not have life and have it more abundantly until it overflows. He did not come for you to have death. He came that you might have life. You are the reason that he died. You are the reason that he shed his blood. You are the reason that he sacrificed himself, that you might have life and have it to the fullest until it overflows. That's the reason why we celebrate his resurrection. Because not only did he give us life, but he has multiplied himself in us that the fullness of that love is perfected in this reality that as he is so are we in this world we are carriers of jesus christ and everything he could do on the earth and more he said greater work shall you do is now in the church in the body in you and i we heal the sick we cast out devils we cleanse lepers we raise the dead we create life everywhere we go when you enter a household where there is no life you confess life when you enter a business where there is no life you confess life when you're in a marriage that doesn't work you confess life when you're in a career that 
doesn't work, you confess life. When you're in a company that doesn't work, you confess life. When you're in a ministry that is dying, you confess life. Whatever is dying, you can now give life because now you have that man who defeated death and he was raised victorious. That is Jesus Christ. That is the man we serve. That is the man we believe. That is the man of the hour. That is the man of the season. That is the man of the century. That is the man of the time. He's the number one. That is the one we are preaching today. That is the one that is bigger than anything that is distorting the world. Oh, I wish men of God invest in just telling the world that God can heal any sickness in this hour. I wish men of God walk out of conspiracy, stop conspirating and just invest time in tech because they can doubt anything we can approve theories and disapprove them but what they cannot doubt is if they tune in the sick tune in and we pray for them live and they are healed by the glorious power of god and doctors can attest to that in those prisons in those hospitals that once this man tuned in this person was dying of covid or hiv or this kind of disease and immediately when they prayed healing went through his body we have seen it happen that would create another wave and another move and the third great awakening would appear that's my prayer that more than ever before in this hour we become more bold and more bold and more bold and more bold and more bold that Jesus Christ is the same today yesterday and forever he walked walks and will always walk that is why you're celebrating this resurrection Sunday that is why you're celebrating it you are one with him now. Just open your mouth and speak to God. Just speak to God. Oh, Rabba Shaka Rabba Kotele Paya Rabba. Rosa Rabba Koseke Rebuko Braza Laba Kaseke Brakata Laba. Robo Sarabba Zalaba Koramando Robo Zarabba Kotele Paya Rabba. Oh, Sarabba Baba Baba. You are all glorious. You are all glorious. My heart in thee, I so must see. You are all glorious. You are what you are, all on earth. Oh, glory to your name, for you alone deserve our highest praise. And forever you will reign. You are all glorious. You are all glorious. My heart in thee, our soul. So I speak life to you. Whether I seek of any disease, we speak life. In your businesses, we speak life. In your careers, we speak life. In your family, we speak life. In your marriage, we speak life. In your commitments, we speak life. In your ministry, we speak life. Father, we receive that life. We receive that joy. For we seek a living God among the living. And we believe every word that you've written. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're there and you've never given your life to Christ and you want to receive him as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to receive him as your Lord and Savior. And if you are there, I want you to repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus. 
believe in my heart that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. And now tonight, this day, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Scenario Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at scenariocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.scenario.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Finero. Finero. Make manifest.